Hi, good morning. Or good okay. afternoon. Hello. Welcome, everybody. It is so lovely to see you all. Welcome. I'm so happy that you're joining me. And uh, this is the third of our four part series we have titled Achieving Greatness, where we have been looking at the initial themes that God put all of us on this planet with a very specific set of strengths as well as weaknesses. And the purpose of us being here is to be in this constant battle. If you woke up this morning and you feel like, oh my gosh, this is a struggle, don't worry, okay? You were supposed to feel that way. I know that the media, TV, those movies, I know Netflix shows you that perfect life where you wake out of wake up and jump out of bed and there's champagne and breakfast is waiting for you and perfectly washed strawberries and raspberries are, are just sitting on the counter. No, you're, you're supposed to wake up and feel, is it just me or am I in the middle of a raging battle right now? Because that's what we are. And our path, our task, our choice is to choose the good. It sounds so simple. And yet that really is what the stuff of life is all about, to choose the good, to be able to see the good and then choose it in our lives. Now, we are going to be focusing on what is really the heart of this course today, which is detecting one's unique mission. This is very important. If you've connected today, I am so happy that you are listening to this because up until now, we have been laying the groundwork. Now, how do we detect and discover our own mission? <clears throat> Let's begin with a story. Always a good idea, right? Let's begin with a story. I want to introduce you. You might know this person's name. I want to introduce you to a person by the name of Sarah Schneira. Anybody heard of Sarah Schneira? Sarah Schneira is a young woman living in the early 1900s in Poland. And she will go on to change the Jewish world, perhaps in a more fundamental way than anybody has changed the Jewish world in the 20th century. How about that for a claim? That's a bold claim opening. Let's see if I can justify that by sharing with you her, her biography. In the beginning of the 20th century, the early 1900s in Poland, the Jewish world is not thriving. After centuries of pogroms and persecution and poverty, Jewish learning in particular has drastically declined. And poverty, let's just focus on one of these sociological factors. Poverty alone created such a strain on families that while they might have had Jewish learning as their highest value, they certainly were not putting all of their children to school because the kids needed to go and work whether it was in the family business, whether it was a cobbler, a tailor, candlestick maker, they did not say, if they had one great child, and let's be honest, one intelligent boy, it would be that boy that they sent to get an education. And men's education was dire. Women's education in Poland Russia, Lithuania in the beginning of the 1900s was even more neglected. And if a woman would be sent to school, typically it would be a non-religious, excuse me, a non-Jewish school that they would attend. And oftentimes it would be the end of their Jewish journey. This is not spoken about much in the history books because it's a sad chapter. 
but many Jewish women left and abandoned Judaism as a result of the non-Jewish schooling they received in Poland and Russia in the early 1900s. There was one young woman who was watching this and said, we have to do something about it. It's not enough to just bemoan the fact that Jewish women are now abandoning Judaism. This woman's name was Sarah Schneira. And in 1918, she opened up the first ever Jewish school for girls. Think about that. It's actually amazing because if Judaism throughout our history has placed one core value upon anything else, it was the value of Jewish education. This is what people would rather, the parent, like, think of Fiddler on the Roof, think of the stereotypes. They would rather go without a meal for dinner so they'd have enough money to pay the Malamed, the tutor that would come to the house to teach their son, again, the boy's Torah. In 1918, Sarah Schneira opens up the first ever Jewish class, formal education for girls. She opens up with 25 girls. And within a short period of time, her institution branches out to a second, third, fourth, and before long, all over Europe. Before the Holocaust, two years before the Holocaust, in 1937, how many, remember her opening school was 1918. So 1937, we're speaking a mere 20 years later, 19 years later, how many schools were in operation under the banner of Sarah Schneider's organization, Jewish Schools for Women? And remember, we're talking Hasidic, we're talking ultra-Orthodox. This was a sea change. This was a massive, enormous sea change. How many schools were open? 19 years later, by 1937, there were 250 schools throughout this network with 38,000 students. 38,000 students. The name with which she gave to this organization was Beit Yaakov. Beit Yaakov. From a verse in the Torah where God gives, actually, it's the Ten Commandments, a very famous passage in the Torah. Just before the Ten Commandments, God says, I'm going to speak to Beit Yaakov. And I'm going to speak to Bnei Yisrael, the house of Jacob and the children of Israel. Why the double name? So the commentaries say that Beit Yaakov, God was going to offer the Torah first to the women because he knew that they would accept it a lot quicker than the men. <laughs> amazing, amazing commentary. When God gave the Torah, he gave it to the women first. He gave it to the Beit Yaakov and only afterwards the Bnei Yisrael, the children of Israel. Today, Beit Yaakov is the largest educational system, Jewish educational system in the world. And all schools in Israel, all schools in North America, Haredi, ultra-Orthodox, Hasidic women's schools will be called Beit Yaakov, or in the Ashkenazis pronunciation, that no one will call it Beit Yaakov, by the way. You might have heard of Beis Yaakov. Have you heard of Beis Yaakov? Right. But the Ashkenazis uh, pronunciation would be Beis Yaakov. <clears throat> this was one woman looking out at the world, asking herself, what's my role in the world? What's my, what's my mission? What am I here for? What's my purpose? What am I supposed to do? And this one person, we talk about the power of one, this one person goes on to radically change the world. Let's begin our class. Ready? <clears throat> I want to go jump straight into source number one, Hasidic thinker. He is a Hasidic Rebbe, Rabbi Shalom Brezovsky. He writes a book called the Nativat Shalom. Again, with the Ashkenazis pronunciation, no one's calling it the Nativat Shalom. You go into a bookstore and say, can I have a copy of the Nativat Shalom, please? They will not know what you're talking. If you say, can I have the Nasiva Shalom, please? It flies off the shelf. It's one of the great bestsellers of the last decade. 
he uh he passed away i think 10 15 years ago i don't remember when he passed away like not not such a long time ago not such a long time ago lived in israel hasidic rebbe and writes an enormous amount of books look at what he says source one <clears throat> before i'll read the english before anything else a person is obligated to reflect upon and search out what is their unique mission for the sake of which they descended to this world. You may have heard this idea before. You may have heard this idea before. And then Ativa Shalom is certainly not the first person to bring it to our attention. But what he is saying is, and we saw this from a few other sources in previous classes, every single one of us has a unique soul and every single one of us therefore has a unique mission okay you need to you need to believe this you need to say it to yourself as a mantra you need to go to bed thinking it you need to wake up seeing it in front of your eyes i'm here for a purpose i'm here for a mission if i've got if i got air in my lungs then there's something that needs doing there's something that needs fixing. There's something that needs fixing. And I want to share with you one of the most beautiful sources you might ever see in all of Judaism. This is taken, source two, Reb Sadok HaKohen Milublin. No, no prizes for guessing where he comes from. He comes from the Polish city of Lublin. Also Hasidic thinker, older. He lived around 250 years ago. Prolific writer. He writes bookshelves worth of books. If you wanted to get the entire works of Reb Sadok, that would be a large bookshelf of many, many volumes. I've got one sentence here. It might just be his most famous ever line. Look what he says. I'm going to read it in the Hebrew because it's profound. I want you to print this off. By the way, you want the source sheet? Email me or put in your email to the chat bar. And at the end of the class, I will happily send you this source sheet. If you do, this is the one you print out, you enlarge, you put in size 48 font, and you stick it on your fridge. Okay? This will change your life. I'm literally giving you the keys to the kingdom right now. You are so lucky. You are so, so lucky. I am silver spoon feeding you the most inspirational thing you'll ever hear in your life. You ready for this? Okay. Just as one must believe in God. So too afterwards must one then believe in themselves. That is so powerful. He wrote that 250 years ago. He wrote that in Poland before a world of neuroses before a world of loss of self-confidence like if you would have said sigmund freud it would have been no he's another hundred years later like he wrote this before it became popular on the new york times top 10 bestsellers list okay like this is this is unbelievable just as one must believe in god so one must believe in themselves. What does that mean? What does that mean? I'll, I'll tell you what that means. It's extremely profound. <clears throat> there are times where we will lose confidence, maybe often, and we'll look in the mirror and the person that's staring back at us, we will say, I can't do it. I just, I can't, I'm not, I'm not up to the task. This is beyond me. This is too big for me. This is too strong for me. This is too difficult for me. This is too broad for me. This is too complicated for me. I can't do it. And that is nothing other than a loss of confidence. Because if we have been assigned a task in our lives, listen to me carefully. If we've been assigned a task in our lives, it means that we can grow into it. I think I've said this now for the three of the three classes that I've given. We grow into the size of our challenges. There is, my rabbi Jonathan Sachs would say this the whole time. He said, he said there was a phenomena of uh, placing fish in a small little pool. 
do you do this in Montreal? It's probably too cold. They'd probably be frozen if you did this in Montreal. In, in England, people, not everyone, but some people have little pools in their back garden. Yeah, a little, a little pool. And they put fish inside the a little pool, maybe goldfish, nothing like, you know, enormous. And there's a phenomenon that scientists notice that to the size that you make the pool, that will then determine the size to which the fish will grow. Have you heard this before? This is fascinating. So if you had a small pool, your fish would grow to be small. And yet the exact same species of fish, if you were to place them in a large pool, they would grow much larger. And my rabbi, Rabbi Sachs, would often say the same is true with our expectations of our children. If we have small expectations for our children, our children will grow up to be small. But if we have big expectations for our children, our children will grow up to be big. I think you can apply that to each and every one of us because we're all children at the end of the day. We're God's children. And God has the largest expectations for all of us. So when we feel like we can't do it, that might be true. But have we slogged our way through? Have we really tried hard? Have we blood, sweat, tears? Have we like tried to the point where it's just been resistance that we feel like we've gone as far as we can and we can go no further? At that point, there's growth. And at that very moment, we grow into the challenges that are in front of us. We become as big as our ideas. We grow to our ideals. It's a profound idea. It's a profound idea. And we have to believe that. And Reb Sadaka Khan is teaching us, do you believe in yourself? Do you believe in your ability? I'm not saying that you're there now. Like a person that's going to the gym for two years, every single day, weights and cardio. Are they going to look like you look like now? I mean, I don't know you. You probably go to the gym every day already. But are they going to look like me now? No, they're not going to. Am I going to? I'm not going to look like them because I don't go to the gym ever. <laughs> but, but if I was to go to the gym for two years, every single day, weights and cardio, I would grow into the challenges that I place in front of myself. So I don't look like that now. But I have to believe that if I put in the effort and growth, I can become that in the future. Amazing idea. Amazing idea. Let's continue now with the next source. <clears throat> source number three. This is fascinating. This is a contemporary and uh, taken from the book called Reb Shlomo Speaks, published by Art Scroll Publishing. Listen to the following. I think back in my own, can you see my screen clearly? Yeah, I'll make it a bit bigger. I think back to my own experience, to when I finally began to make something of my life. And I can identify the day. In those days, I was in yeshiva, surrounded by a group of brilliant near geniuses. These were my friends, my associates, my role models. And I tried to pattern myself after them. And then one day, I sat down in a room by myself, put my head in my hands, and had a heart-to-heart -heart talk with myself. You are not brilliant, I told myself. You are not a genius or a near genius. You have to be who you are. You have to start your learning from the fundamentals and work your way up. There are no shortcuts for you. Believe me, the experience was painful. I felt as if a dagger had been plunged into me, but it was my liberation, my personal exodus. That day was the turning day in my life. I think we all make that mistake of seeing brilliant people around us. I know I do. I'm speaking personally. You speak to or you are accompanying or you are an acquaintance of just brilliant people. And I know so many brilliant people. And I say to myself, gosh, I really wish I could be like them. <laughs> they're, they're brilliant. He's so brilliant. She's so brilliant. And 
And it's a fundamental flaw because we're not ever supposed to be somebody else. We're never supposed to be somebody else. And we can't model ourselves after somebody else because we would be stealing from who? From ourselves. We'd be involved in an act of theft. As strange as that sounds, it's actually, I want you to think about this for a while. To try to be somebody else is to steal from yourself, your very essence. We can never be somebody else. We can only be ourselves. Take a look at source number four, also a contemporary <clears throat> book called Bridging the Gap. Man's essence, the true I, is within. That's the key word in this whole paragraph, within. It is the inner world with which we are primarily concerned. Individuality and originality must be nurtured internally. The modern misconception is that our individuality must be presented externally, displayed for others to see. Otherwise, goes the misconception, by not expressing our individuality to others, we are stunting ourselves. The culture in which we find ourselves lives life on the outside. Torah, or I would change that word for Judaism, is coming from a um, certain perspective where the word Torah means all of Judaism. So Judaism, however, demands that we build our inner worlds, that we nurture our individuality within, for that is the essence of a human being. I don't think there's been a more powerful time in human history where this line is more true. Where this line is more true. I'll read it again, the cult that I highlighted. The culture in which we find ourselves lives life on the outside. That is a very sad reality. If you want to know to what degree that is true, you simply have to look up the largest companies in the world today. And you will see that they are Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or what's now called X, Snapchat, social media apps where we share with the universe, a TikTok, hey, holy TikTok, you can't leave that one out from the group. You, These are apps that allow us to live our lives broadcasting to the universe. And what's worse, I'm going to get into my uh, social media diatribe here. Allow me 30 seconds, then I'll get back on track. What's worse than posting what you had for dinner? My God, Baruch Hashem, I didn't post the soup that I had for it was it was delicious. My wife made a lovely soup; it's very nice. But I didn't post it on Instagram. What's worse than posting what you had for dinner? Going back to your social media account an hour later to see how many people liked your post. And if no one likes it, what happens? You feel like, oh, that's sad. That's a real shame. No one liked my. And if a hundred people like it, suddenly, oh, I'm 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 a somebody. I'm not just I'm not like those regular people called human beings. I'm an influencer. And it's an amazing, it's an amazing people's inner state of well-being is impacted to the degree that other people may like a status update that people have posted on their social media channels. But what about our inner world? What about our inner world? You know what someone will never see? Someone will never see um, an act of patience Let's take one of the greatest virtues that there that there is. One of the greatest virtues of all is patience. I know I don't have it, but I'm 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 exempt. I have four small people that live in my house, so I'm 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 allowed to be angry always. 
but I, I don't have patience. Um, let's say there's a moment where you're in line at the supermarket and you're in a hurry and there's a person in front of you. They're paying for their product. They're counting out the pennies from their purse. Has that ever happened to you? You're in a hurry. You're at the supermarket. You're in line. And the person in front of you is taking forever. Oh, they've got coupons. <laughs> Let's not forget the coupons. Hang on. I think I've got a coupon for this one. And inside, you're bubbling over. And then you remember a class that you took with me. And you say, you know what? I'm not going to get angry. Rabbi Fishman said patience is a virtue, the greatest one there is. I'm going to calm myself down. I'm going to control myself. I'm going to overcome my inner anger right now. And you do. You succeed. And you go on your way. Will anyone in the world, maybe someone who's even with you in line, will anyone in the world know what you just accomplished? No one. Unless, of course, you share your inner world. But no one will ever know the heroic challenge you overcame and the incredible success you achieved in being able to reach that level. How amazing is that? How absolutely amazing is that? That is something called real life. And that's something lived on the inside. And that's something nobody will ever know. And yet we believe in Judaism. The building our inner worlds is the very essence of who we are. Fascinating, right? So, so different than modern contemporary society. <clears throat> Next. Next. This is um, a teacher who teaches in Jerusalem. Uh, questions or uh, comments? Let me just pause for a second. I know I'm running through it, but uh, did anyone want to? Are you with me? Is it is it okay? Yeah. Question. Any questions? Any comments? Are you, is, is this speaking to you? Is there something here that you're like, okay, okay, good. I, I this is the most. By the way, asking me, I think this is the most inspirational stuff on the planet. This is fire. This is absolute fire. This is so inspiring. Um, let's keep going. Let's keep going. So. Um, where are we? Okay, so take a look. This is a contemporary teacher teaches uh, new rabbis in Jerusalem. There's an English language program for rabbis who are graduating, and their goal is going to be to go out to communities all over the world. Rabbi Beryl Gershenfeld is one of the teachers in this course of a teacher training program for new rabbis. He wrote a book. The book is called, uh, sorry, he gave a class. The class was written up. The class was written up, and this is a quote, a passage from the class that he, he gave. Let's see what he says. Our rabbis teach us that among the traits that help us acquire the Torah is the trait of recognizing one's place. Okay, there's two ideas here. There's an idea called acquiring the Torah. There is an idea in Judaism that you can make Judaism yours. You can make this body of wisdom we call the Torah internal to you. We're not talking about facts here. This is very important. We are not talking about knowledge of simply knowing information. We're talking about how you internalize these values so that you transform yourself into a personality who's kind, who's caring, who loves to perform acts of, of loving kindness, who is patient, who is someone who has deep empathy, who runs to help others. That's what it means to acquire the Torah. Okay, One of the traits of having that transformation is recognizing one's place. Fascinating. Recognizing one's place. The major requirement for real success is knowing who we are. Though it is not clear that one should spend much time looking for one's special path in the earliest stages of one's development. When one is laying the basis for one's future growth, in the long run, this must be done. One cannot achieve deep success by just following others. Everyone comes with a unique root of one's soul. In Hebrew, beautiful phrase, Shoresh Hanashama. 
a shoresh hanashama. Everyone comes with a unique root of one's soul. Our spirituality is different. Our reality is different. Our, the way we see the world is different. This precious uniqueness is ours and ours only. Just like a person will look silly wearing someone else's clothes, one will never really succeed by mimicking another's path in life. There's simply no one platonic ideal of the one perfect human. Everyone's perfection will differ and will be achieved in a different way. In a Torah commentary, the Nitziv, he is a rabbi of the 19th century, he says that if someone asks you to tell him what path they should take, your answer should be that they must pursue the path that their heart desires within the broad realm of Judaism. If anyone should ever ask you, what should I do in life? Where should I go in life? Who should I be? What should I try to accomplish? You never answer your dreams that were left unfulfilled from your childhood. That's a disaster. And I say that tongue in cheek, but there are so many people who turn to a parent and said, mom, dad, what should I be? I don't know. And it's that innocent question. And the father who now bemoans the fact that he has to go to work on Wall Street every day. And a deep part of him always wanted to be a doctor. But now he's looking at numbers and crunching them on a screen. He turns to his child and says, son, you should be a doctor. <laughs> we are not our parents' missed dreams. And if anybody should ever ask us, what should I do with my life? The answer is always look inward, look internally. Who do you want to be? Where do you want to go? What is it that you wish to become? Because only you know the answer to that. I had, I'll just go off on a tangent. I had an amazing, amazing teacher when I was in yeshiva. And he had various qualities, many qualities. His greatest by far, he was so wise and he, he was amazing. His greatest by far was listening. He, he was the best listener I've ever met. In fact, before I met him, I had never met a listener before. Because in our world, we don't listen. We talk. We love to fill the silence with words. In fact, in English, we have a phrase for that. It's called, um, what's it called? An awkward silence. Right. Have you ever had a conversation with someone or been at the table for dinner and then suddenly it goes a bit quiet and everyone's like shuffling their peas around the plate with their knife and fork looking downwards because it's gone all quiet. It's, that's an awkward silence. This teacher, he did not know from awkward silences. You could sit with him for minutes and he would not say anything. And when I say minutes, they felt like hours because if you weren't used to it, it was, the first time I ever sat down with him, I, I, remember, I will remember this forever. I had a question. And I didn't know him yet. He was just my new teacher. So I went, I sat at his desk, and I said, Rabbi, in the most naive, innocent way, I was young once upon a time. I said, Rabbi, I have a question. And he's like, okay. And I said, here's my question. He's like, okay. And I asked the question, and he 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 nods. He he looked at me. His active listening, he, the body language, perfect, right? The nodding, the mm hmm mm hmm. And then he just sits there. He just sits there, and he's looking at me. And that that made it even what like eye contact. Oh my god! Have you ever had eye contact with someone else having eye contact? I mean, if you're deeply in love with them, and it's a first date, and you're over candles and a bottle of wine, there's nothing better than you know gazing into someone's eyes. But Outside of that, eye contact and an awkward silence, it doubles the awkwardness of the awkward silence. So he's looking at me and I'm looking at him very quickly. I'm looking down at my shoes and he doesn't say anything. He just keeps staring at me. I swear to you, it must have been 45 seconds. OK, that felt like an eternity. Could you imagine 45 seconds? It was the longest period of time, at least 45 seconds. What happens next? I got so awkward. I got so uncomfortable that I started throwing out possible suggestions to my own deep life question simply because I couldn't bear the silence anymore. 
So I started, well, maybe if I do X, perhaps that will, and that was a silly idea, obviously. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> obviously I wouldn't do that. That's great. Maybe I should do Y because, uh, no, no, that, that also wouldn't work because of A, B, and C. But you know what? Perhaps Z would be the approach that I should take. And yes, actually, that makes a lot of sense. Indeed, I th the amount, the, now the more I think about it, if I actually pursue this path, that would be, okay, fantastic. Problem solved. Thank you so much. And he still hasn't said a single word. And he's smiling now. And he's still nodding with his active body language. And I like awkwardly stand up from the chair, run a mile in the opposite direction. And this is who he, and I sat with him for three years. I sat with him for three years. He, he, he is an amazing human being, amazing human being. And he taught me how to listen. Now, I don't have many good qualities, <laughs> and even my listening is pretty poor, <laughs> but I try. I try. I'm at least conscious of the fact that when someone's talking to me, I try to listen, and, and it makes all the difference in the world. It makes all the difference in the world. Why am I telling you about my beloved teacher who taught me how to listen? Let me go back to this source. And hopefully there will be something right. If someone's going to ask you, what path should I take in my life? Tell them that they have to figure it out for themselves. Amazing. Okay. Now comes the absolute silver platter that I'm handing you. How do you figure it out? Let's get tachlis, as they say in Israel. Practically speaking, what do I do? And here I'm going to give you a three-step exercise either do a screenshot or ask me to email you this source sheet. Here is the whole world on a silver plate. Number one, step one, draw a circle labeled, what am I able to do? And include all the important things that make you, you. You're a good listener. Maybe you prefer machines to people. Perhaps you're fantastic at math. Maybe you like business and you want to be busy maybe you're a people person maybe you need to create maybe you're an artist whatever and 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 don't make the list two things if i was to give you 50 things i'm sure you would find 50 things what am i able to do you're able to do many things step 2 draw another circle write down what do i like doing <laughs> That's not always what am I able to do. And in the what do I like doing, include all the things you're drawn to. What do you like doing? Whether you are able to do them or not, you might say, I love cycling, but I don't have a bike. I don't know. That's a silly example. You might say, I love when people come to me and ask for advice, but not many people come to me and ask for it. It doesn't matter. Write down what you like to do. And step three, draw a circle labeled, what is my society, my community, and my God, what do they need from me? And include all the things that are practical, considering where you come from, where you will live, which community you are in, where you are at terms in where you are there and where you're at in terms of religious observance. So I think all of us realize we might not believe in, it goes back to that first source of Rab Sadak, we have to believe in ourselves. We might not believe that we can make a difference, but we all realize that there's a brokenness to our societies. Now, you might not be able to change Canada, and that's okay. You're not in a position where you've got the influence and ability to change an entire country. You might not be able to change Montreal or Vancouver or Tel Aviv or wherever it is that you're tuning into from. But okay, you're not expected to change your entire city, but you do have a circle of influence, and that sphere you do have an impact upon. What does that look like? It might just be your family. It might be your brother. It might be those closest to you. It might, you might be a teacher in a classroom and have 25 souls that you're able to change and impact. It might be your clients. 
and ask yourself, what am I able to do to make this brighter? What do they need from me? What does God need from me? And amazingly, you will be able to have a confluence coming together of what you're able to do meets what you enjoy doing, meets what is needed from you. And that's where God wants you to be. I'll say that again. Where you can join what you're able to do together with what you like doing and where that meets what's needed, that's where God wants you to be. Okay. So far, so good? Okay, I'm going to go on. A little bit more, a little bit more, just a couple more sources. This is an amazing book that you have to buy. However, it's got a terrible title. And I feel so sorry for Rabbi Akiva Tatz. He is a contemporary. He is brilliant, brilliant man. Um, grew up non-religious in Johannesburg. Trained as a medical doctor. Got his degree in medicine. Um, a number of years, is, is it still? I don't remember. Does South Africa still have compulsory conscription to the South African army? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. A number of years ago, South Africa had a uh, compulsory uh, conscription. So he, after medical school, was in the army with his best friend. His best friend is killed on a training practice and it changes his life. He suddenly starts asking the big questions, what's the purpose of my life? You know, here I was with my best friend in the army. It was an, an accident. Um, why am I here? What's the purpose of life? What's the meaning behind all of this? And he goes through a transformation where he becomes religious. Today, he actually is a rabbi that teaches in London, England. He left South Africa, studied in Israel for many, many years, and he's a brilliant author. His great skill, he has many great skills, is he can take very complex ideas and put them into simple English language from a written perspective. This book is a brilliant book. And my only complaint at the publishers is they gave it such a terrible title. They called it The Thinking Jewish Teenager's Guide to Life. And they ruined the book. Because if you are not a Jewish teenager, no one is ever, you're not going to be motivated to buy a book like that for yourself. So ignore the title, buy the book, and then let me know after you finish reading it. And I promise you, you will turn around and you'll say, that was an amazing book. Thank you so much for telling me to read that book. That was a great book. You, I, you, you will say that, okay? I know you will say that. Okay, so let's look at a simple, small passage from this book. If you were placed on a building site with a bag of tools by an intelligent foreman, all you need do is look around and see what is being built in your immediate vicinity and what tools you have been given, and you will know immediately what you should be doing. Obviously, you have been given exactly the tools you need for the job. Life is not a joke. You have a task to accomplish. And you have definitely been given all you need to accomplish it. A careful examination of your place in the world and your personal character tools will give you a clear picture of who you are and what you must do. Again, the tools match the job exactly. We understand that the one with a capital O, the one who creates the whole enterprise, gives every individual exactly what he or she needs to carry out the work that is necessary. This is such a beautiful metaphor. This is such a beautiful metaphor. You're on a building site, you've got a bag of tools by an intelligent foreman. Look around you and see what you've got to do. You'll know what your task is. It's same with us. Examine your place in the world. Where are you right now? Where are you? 
And it doesn't matter where you are. Where you are is exactly where you need to be today, right now. And what are your personal character tools that will give you a clear picture of what you must do and why you are here? Incredible. Incredible. I want to skip the next one. I want to skip the next one and go into one last one. One last one. Because this comes with a great um, website that's extremely useful. I told you, today is the best day. You're, you're, you're getting everything today. Rav uh, Matisyahu Rosenblum. <clears throat> Don't know who he is. Don't know who he is. I found this source. Let's take let's take a look. Uh, da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da. Go from the second line. The founders. The founders of positive psychology of the positive psychology movement have found that a shift of focus onto our strengths, something that is for most of us by no means natural leads to far greater success in life, however they define success. The problem is that most of us do not find it very easy to recognize our strengths. For this reason, these psychologists have created, have generated a list of character strengths that are widely valued across many cultures. Excuse me, they found that even people who are not fully conscious of their strengths if they are presented with a list of 24 possible strengths, can usually find between two or five such characteristics. This discovery can feel like an epiphany as they recognize that such a strength feels authentic. Otherwise known as, wow, this is the real me. And it's associated with excitement when using it and rapid learning of, in themes associated with that strength. This is found in the Handbook of Positive Psychology, written by Christopher Peterson. This list is found on their website, viastrengths.org. There's your link for today, viastrengths.org, and could be a useful tool to start searching for these character strengths. Similarly, the book Now, Discover Your Strengths, argues that the greatest growth in one's professional success lies in discovering and perfecting one's strengths and provides a list of 34 natural strengths to help discover one's own. What I wanted to share through some of these sources today is that, and this is incredibly important, not only do we have a unique mission that we've already seen, but beyond the fact that we have a unique mission, there is something that we are indeed capable of achieving, and it lies within. How to discover it, that is the process of self-discovery. And it's extremely important that, one, we believe in ourselves that we do have those good character traits within us, and two, that we believe that we are here for the very reason to use those good character traits. Otherwise, what are we doing here? Otherwise, it becomes like that bumper sticker that says, the person with the most toys at the end wins. Is that is that what this is? Are we simply collecting toys? You know, and as you get older, with a little bit more money, it changes from Lego and it suddenly becomes a Lamborghini. And I don't mean a Lego Lamborghini. I actually I actually mean a, a car. I, like you, it's toys. It's toys. Is that why I'm here? To come home and show off for my street. Ah, breathe it in, everybody. I just got a Ferrari. I'm so happy. <clears throat> Okay, and you got angry at the salesperson in the store because you don't have any patience. So at the same time, the loss of patience that you had when you were throwing a tantrum at the age of six, you're still throwing a tantrum at the age of 66. What's, what's the achievement there? What's the accomplishment there? You got a big shiny toy. The world is a world that is in need of fixing. 
And we are all agents of that hope in somebody else's life. And to be able to be there for somebody and steward them through a challenging moment literally heals the brokenness in our world. And we can only accomplish that to the best of our ability if we first know who we are. And that will then answer the second question, what am I here to do? Good luck. Let me know how it goes. I'll see you at 120. <laughs> Questions, comments, uh, any, anything? Feel free. Anybody? Okay. I hope this was meaningful. I hope this was uh, inspirational. I hope this has given you something to think about. I hope this has given you something to motivate you. And uh, drop drop uh, your email address in the chat bar. And I'm going to, if you wish, and I'll email you the source sheet. Okay. All right, my friends. Going to stop the recording. <laughs>